So often we are left feeling like we're less than and don't deserve the love of God. And that's not true. That's not true, people. He, he, uh, he loves us. But when we feel that way, it makes us doubt. It, it makes us discouraged. It makes us fearful. It makes us feel abandoned. And all of those things, those are symptoms, those are the preliminary symptoms or the symptoms of defeat. And the Bible says that we are more than conquerors. And he doesn't want us to live in defeat. He doesn't want those symptoms to take over our lives and take over who we are, take over how we think about ourselves and how we view our God. I've had tons of conversations over the past couple of months and, and um, so many people going through different situations. And I knew that we needed a message that assured us of who he is in our lives and, and, and the, how much that he loves us. Because these people felt unworthy. These people were living in a, in, in a, in a way far beneath who he says you are. Far beneath who he is in our lives. So I know we needed it. I need it. Because we all go through things at times, right? And we all need to be assured of the love of the Father. So my prayer today is that when we leave, that we'll leave encouraged, that we will leave overwhelmed, that we'll leave overwhelmed by how much he loves us. And because of that, we will look more to the love that he has for us instead of our circumstances. Let's pray. Lord, I, I, I thank you so much for being our God and and I thank you for that, that great love that you have for us. Lord God, and I'm just, I'm praying, Lord, that as I speak, that people will be encouraged, that, that people will feel puffed up, that they will know who you are in their lives and know that you love them with a great, sincere, true, deep, wide love. Lord, so go before every word that I say. And I pray, Lord, that it would reach everyone's heart, reach into their spirit, Lord, and, and, and uh, encourage and challenge them at the same time. Amen. Our text today is Romans 8, 28 through 39. And um, I want to tell everybody, you have to, if you have not taken some time to just read Romans, you should. Uh, Don, what do you call it? The furnace of the Bible? Is that what you called it? Something like that, right? Because I'm in there, if you read it, man, you find out who you are. You find out who he is. You find out why he came. You get some power in Romans. Okay, so when you're just figuring, trying to figure out what you want to read today, and, um, and maybe you don't want to read your Joyce Meyer devotion, read Romans. It'll give you some, some uh, oomph, for lack of a better word, some oomph. In your, uh, in your life, in your faith, and in your walk, and in who you are. Um, I love this uh, passage because I feel like Paul, when he was um, writing it, that it was, it was just like a teacher or a mentor as he was writing it. You know, it's couched between some encouragement and some truth, you know how a mentor will, will tell you some truth and they'll give you some, you know, some encouragement and then they'll tell you this is how it is and then they give you the end and the end is kind of, you know, this is, this is how it is and this is some encouragement as well, but there's some stuff in the middle. I feel like that's how he did it. But at the same time, I feel like how he did it is, is powerful and it should encourage you. And I like added some stuff to it, but I'll tell you when I'm adding stuff to it because you're going to look up there and you'll be like, it doesn't say that. But when I say it, I'm hoping that as I'm saying it, that you'll start getting it in your spirit to say it too. It says 828, and we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. That's a promise. That's a promise that we can count on in God's word. But... And we know that in all things, God works for the good. Good. What is good? 
So we can look at that and want to be encouraged by it. But at the same time, if you walk away thinking that all things work for the good and you feel a little bit discouraged because you're like, it didn't work out for the good, the good that I thought. We have to know that our good might not be God's good. God has a greater good in mind. You know how you deal with your kids and your kids think that something is good and they want it and they want it right now because it's good. And you can look at it and you go, that is good. But I can see a little bit further down the line and how that will impact you, how that will impact others, what that can do to your life. And so what you think is good and could be good right now, I can see how it's not good. Do you have those conversations with your kids, nieces, nephews, grandchildren? That's where we have to be when we look at that and we go, and we know that he'll work all things out for our good. It's the good that he knows for us. It's his good. And I know that because it says after that, who have been called according to his purpose. So in order to achieve his purpose, he's going to work things out for the good that leads to his purpose being done in our lives and in the lives of those around us. Amen? So, next, 829. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his son that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. God called us. We responded. We want him to leave our lives. And he justifies, which is, it justifies as an instantaneous legal act of God where he thinks of our sins as forgiven, gone as far as from the east is to the west. And we take on the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And it's given to us. We have righteousness in his sight. So those times when you are beating yourself up all the time because of something that you did, he doesn't have to come back and do it all over again. We have been declared forgiven and we are made righteous in his sight. I know that when I'm thinking about my life and my journey, when I think about how I've been pardoned of sins that I am guilty of, it makes me want to pursue him and holiness in a greater way. I don't want to take for granted what he did for me on that cross. I don't want to take for granted the fact that he gave me a pass on some things that I should have been guilty and found guilty of. And whatever came with it. Eight thirty one. What then shall we say in response to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? So he was telling us who we are. I want you to know who you are. I want you to know what God did for you. I want you to know that, that you've been justified, that, that you are, are no longer a slave to sin, that you have been made righteous in his sight. So what then shall we say in response to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? This is a powerful statement of God. It's clear, it's direct. Who can be against us? But my question to you is, where do we get tripped up on it at? Do we wrestle with if God? Do we wrestle with that as believers? Do we struggle knowing that he's there for us no matter what? Because we're still living in shame. We're still living feeling condemned. Do we wrestle with the statement at all? What? then shall we say, if God is for us, who can be against us? Is that one of those statements that remind us that we probably are going to have somebody against us? So we kind of offended by the statement anyway. But it's to tell you who can stand against you if God the Father is your creator and has justified you. Who can stand against you? And in the next verse, it's like he wants to continue to empower you 
with more information and more truth. And this is where I'm going to start neonizing it. Because I feel like there should be some stuff in, 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 in front of it. So for 832, I feel like it should say, and as a matter of fact, you know how you're telling somebody something and you really want to tell them the truth and you really want them to understand and you're like, look, as a matter of fact, this, that, and the other. As a matter of fact, he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? God did not spare his own son when we were enemies. We were enemies, not friends. In him giving us what he gave us, we know, we have to believe that he will do everything, everything to finish the work that was done on the cross. So it should assure us, it has to assure us of his promises. It has to assure us of his presence. It has to assure us of his love. It has to. He gave his only son. He did not spare his own son. The next verse. And as a matter of fact, who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. He's telling you this over and over again. It's for a purpose. It's for a reason. So let me speak to your self-talk. You catch it? Let me speak to that inner talk, that inner voice that's telling you some condemning stuff about yourself. Let me speak to the people who condemn you. Let me speak to the people who persecute you. That's what he's saying. It's God that justifies. So before you start talking to yourself about how bad and unworthy you are, before you listen to someone tell you that you're not good and you're not right. It is God who justifies. Some of y'all need to walk away with that. I needed it. I needed it. And I have to remind myself when I'm telling myself something, shut up, Nina. That's not what God said. It's not what he said. And the reason why is because whatever he is charging us with, anyone, and whatever we're charging ourselves with, being justified says, I made that right. I made that right. Eight thirty four. And as a matter of fact, who is he that condemns? No one. Christ Jesus, who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. He continues and says that Jesus Christ, Son of God, is seated at the right hand of God. Listen to me, too. Speaking on our behalf. God the Son is speaking to God the Father on your behalf. What better advocate do you have? It doesn't matter what your words say. It doesn't matter how unholy you felt like your prayer was. It doesn't matter how the words might not have been right. It doesn't even matter what you ask for. Because you have a human sacrificial filter interceding on your behalf to our God. You can't have a better advocate. 35. And as a matter of fact, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? <laughs> it 
His love is amazing. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? It sits, it waits. It was there before you loved him. It was there before you believed. It's there when you don't like him. It's there when you are unhappy. It's there before you called out his name. His love is there and it waits and it exists for us regardless. But it's up to us to apply it. It's up to us to accept it. It's up to us to receive it and allow it to do what it came to do. Thank you for your love. And as a matter of fact, it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. He says, look, look, I know you're going through some stuff. And he wrote this to show that suffering and tribulations don't separate us from his love. It brings us closer to our ultimate goal. In your relationship, what does the counselor or the pastor or your friend tell you about suffering in your marriage? Every time you go through some challenges, it strengthens your relationship. Isn't that what they say? Isn't that the case? Every time we get through some, some mountains and some valleys, our relationship on the other side comes out stronger. And it's how we know that we are in this relationship working together. So we can't have love, the love of God, without some tribulation because that's what relationships are. Our marriages are the closest thing to, 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 um, to show us what the relationship with the Father's like. So as we work together through trials and tribulations, through good times and bad, for better and for worse, we enter into relationship, and that's how we enter into our relationship with Christ. So when you are going through something, you are in the thick of it in your relationship with Christ. You are entering into that relationship with Christ. You are in the ebb and flow of a relationship with your heavenly Father, a loving relationship. This world hates who Jesus loves. And so since we've entered into that relationship, his friends will be our friends and his enemies are against us too. John 15, 18, 20 reads, this is Jesus speaking. It says, if the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I've chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. Remember the words I spoke to you. No servant is greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. And it says all day long. For, we, for your sake, we face death all day long. So maybe you're not going through something. But the clock's ticking. Every second. And we're all subject to going through something at some point in time of our lives. We just are. But Matthew 5, 10, 12 says, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets, who were before you. And as a matter of fact, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Don't be afraid. Don't get caught up in the fact that we enter into this relationship and suffering comes along with it. That's how it is. We can't take on his glory and not take on his suffering. We've already been set free. That would be taking it for granted, wouldn't it? And there's, by the way, if the, in the New Testament, there's no shortage of verses that speak to suffering. So it's something that we're guaranteed. There's no shortage of verses. You will see that we not only enter into his suffering, but into his eternal glory as well. And as a matter of fact, 
For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nor broke, nor unliked, nor talked about, nor envied, nor hated, nor sickness, nor floods. I'm Nina Nizen. Nor targeted, nor belittled, nor berated, nor attacked, nor nothing can separate you from the love of God. So whatever you're going through in your mind, whatever that is, that you is that's separating. You, a person, someone talking about you, someone belittling you, someone making you feel less than, someone taking from you something that is yours. Do you got sickness in your body? Do you have nothing in your pockets? Nothing, 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 height nor depth can separate you from the love of God. Nothing, nothing. Second Corinthians says, but we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all surpassing power is from God and not from us. We are hard pressed on every side, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. So what are you facing today? Whatever it is, you're right in the thick of that relationship. The ebb and flow of your relationship with Jesus Christ. All his glory and some suffering. But that's how you know you're in that relationship. That's how you are assured of the love. I don't know how much my husband uh, loves me until I make it hard for him. <laughs> and I do. I make it easy and I make it hard. But when it's hard and he loves me through it, I am assured of his love, the love that never leaves you, never forsakes you, keeps you, strengthens you. We need to also know that we're going to have, an ad, we're going to have some adversity. But 2 Timothy says, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ will be persecuted. Comes with the territory. So dig in. You are in union with Christ Jesus, King of Kings, Lord of Lords. Which, when it comes down to it, I was talking about my husband, but I'm like, ooh, that's a nicer, better relationship. That's a stronger relationship. That's a relationship that guarantees me victory right there. So I might have to deal with some things. But hold on, because we all know that he doesn't leave you. And there's no greater love than the love of our Father. And that's as a matter of fact. So church... Be encouraged. Be strengthened. Know that this is where it's at, if that's where you're at. And that you are right in the center of his love and right in the center of that relationship. So feel strong and empowered. And know that you'll have victory on the other side. Amen? Amen. Amen.